of mortality rejection in this group of patients. And again, um, the patients who did not undergo transplantation over a period of three years, only less than 10% of the patients were still alive. Although this is quite, uh, quite, I would say, alarming uh, uh, to see the number, the patients who did not have transplant didn't do as well. Um, this is a little old data. We know that we have come a, come, come a long, long way in, in managing these patients with effective chelations and transfusions. But I think this, this really shows how important um, it is in, in a thalassemia, especially to have them in a proper low risk state to achieve um, good outcomes. Now, how to address these class 3 patients? The patients who don't do well in the traditional conditioning with blue cell phone cyclophosphamide, how to, how to address these patients? So, what they, again, Italians have shown that is that we can really do that by down risking these patients and by using a simple strategy of preparing these patients prior to transplant for one and a half month with using what we call as hypertransfusions to, to, and hydroxyurea to bring down the extramedullary hematopoiesis, give immunosuppression with, with azathioprine and then uh, for one and a half months and then transplant using a little bit different conditioning which they had used earlier using fludarabine, busulfan, cyclophosphamide and EGT conditioning. What they demonstrated is in these class 3 patients you could now again achieve a, a cure rate about 90 odd percent. So again, you know, thalassemia transplant is never emergency. You, you have enough time to prepare this patient or down the patients. You may not be able to always down risk them for example, someone has already set up a portal fibrosis that may not be reversible, but at least you can um, bring their XML recommended choices, bring their, bring their iron overload down so that the outcomes can be optimized. Now, um, uh, some work on this has been done in India as well. This was from, from Bello. They, 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 they further classified this class 3 patient to two subgroups. They said they class 3 are highest class 3s and, and the lowest class 3s. The highest class 3s is the patient who is more than 7 years and also got liver more than 5 centimeters. So the, the older you are, the higher, the, the, big, the bigger liver you have, if it's more than 5 centimeters and the age is more than 7 years, these are the higher, the higher high risk ones and they have done really poorly in their, in their, in their experience, 20% outcomes, which is something which we really don't want in a thalassemia transplant. The ones who were lowest class 3s, they had about outcomes about 70 odd percent. Now, going on to the alternative donor transplants. So we know that about 25 to 30 percent of the patients who need transplants for any indication will have a mad sibling. That leaves around 70 percent of the patients without a mad sibling, and we need to look for an alternative donor. One of the alternative donors, which is which has been there for the last almost 30 years now, is unrelated donor transplant, where you look for an actually matched donor in international registries, and and for the period of time that's also got refined with the availability of high resolution typing and matching them at at the elite level or what you call as 10 by 10 or 12 by 12 um, um, uh, these days. So this was the initial experience of thalassemia. We know thalassemia is a, uh, is, is a very interesting disease, you know. These patients are highly immune competent, they are immune, they are they're sensitized with a lot of blood transfusions throughout their life, especially those who have not received liquid depleted, irradiated bloods. So they are highly sensitized. So the initial experience using the same strategy but these for math siblings didn't really work. There was a very high graph rejection and transplant-related mortality, and thalassemia cell all about 20 percent. So 20 percent patients would 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 would, uh, would have a thalassemia-free survival in the initial data. It got a little better. This is the this is the survival. So survival is still um, 60 to 70 percent because most of them have rejected and had autologous recovery. Um, and event-free survival that means thalassemia-free survival is only about 20 percent. So only 20 percent patients could be cured really of using unrelated donor transplants. But this is again the experience from, from Italy, so they, they, this was the initial paper from, from with using unrelated donor transplants. They, they, they did work on the conditioning a little bit and what, what they showed is that if we have to make the conditioning in unrelated donor transplants a little more immunosuppressive so that the graft rejection can be, can be managed. And this was the experience from Italy about it, which was improved from 20% to 60-65% survival over 80% and they again this data set showed that it's very important, even for unrelated donor transplant, it's very important what risk stratification the patient is before transplantation. And the class 1s and class 2s did better than class 3s. 80% healthy, 3 are available for class 1 and class 2, and about 50 odd percent for class 3. So, unrelated donor transplant getting better, but I think probably still not as good as the math siblings. And the class also does play an important role. Now, the second option. Uh, of uh, alternative donor transplantation is cord blood transplant and uh, we also know that cord blood transplant has been there for a while now and this is um, the, the, the this is this is the data from Eurocord and this, this gives the gives the gives the outcomes of cord blood transplant to sickle cell and thalassemia 
Now, the, the catch here is these are related cord bloods. So these are the sibling cord bloods which have been used for transplantation. So these are the index children who had thalassemia, siblings were born, cords were stored, and those were used for transplantation. Outcomes are not that too bad. 80 to 80 to 80 percent thalassemia, better than sickle cell. We know the sickle cells are less sensitized. They actually receive less blood transfusion, so they have lesser rejection as compared to thalassemia. But when you look at the unrelated donor cords, the ones who are taken from unrelated donor registries or un unrelated donor cord blood banks, um, outcomes are not that good. Although this is the Taiwanese paper, I think Taiwan is the only place probably with a lot of transplants with, with, with in thalassemia with cord blood. The outcomes about 70, 70 to 75 percent. But the experiences uh, all across the world, even in our own country, uh, are not really great with cord blood for various reasons. Because cord blood's quality in India is, is a concern. Um, rejection rates are very high. Our children are more sensitized uh, because of non leukolipidic bloods, and we face very really high rejection rates, about more than 50 percent with cord blood. So that's why cord blood transplantation, especially of unlit cord blood transplant transplant is not a great option for thalassemia. Uh, we have been using some cord bloods which are related cord bloods but that has been predominantly co-infusion. So if a child, if the donor is small, you take the cord blood and then and then top up with, the, with, with some of the marrow from, from the mat, from the from the sibling and that has really you know, given quick, quick engraftment, low rejection rates. But 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 but, but uh, uh, isolated cord as a transplant option has really come down, especially non-renal indications like thalassemia. Uh, now, these are the three important complications in thalassemia which we address. Graft rejection, I explained you already, and it can be really, um, really disheartening. Uh, you know, we see about five to seven percent rejection even in mass sibling settings, and that it can go up to thirty odd percent in a haploid transplant setting. Menopause is a big disease of the liver. Again, a very typical complication of thalassemia major, and it is so much depends on what conditioning we have used and what is the class stratification of the patient prior to transplantation. Um, I, I don't have the time, but you know, with, with the newer reduced intensity <coughs> transplants, which is using Treya Sulfan, Thaitipa, this has been addressed to a great extent, especially in the class 3 patients. So now we at other centers do use uh, reduced intensity transplants for class 3 patients to, 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 um, to overcome this problem of venoclusive disease. Graphic source disease, again, thalassemia is a benign disorder. Um, we do not want to, we, we never want to give this child another disease of graft versus host disease, especially chronic graft versus can be, which can be dealt, dealt, you know, a, a problem by itself in long term. So, these are some of the three complications we always uh, we need to consider, um, especially in the thalassemic patient uh, and, uh, and, and, and have, the, uh, have that data ready to, to be, you know, um, to be expressed to the families uh, when they are um, considering the option of transplantation for the cure of this disease. Now, what is the data in our center and, uh, and, and, and elsewhere? Um, this is the this is the stem cell data, um, um, this is stem cell registry data from India, and, and thalassemia forms around 15% uh, of the, all the transplants done in our country. And if we take the allogenic transplants, it forms about 25%. So, quarter of the allogenic transplants in India are done for thalassemia. Major. I think we still are quite a, quite 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 way uh, behind because, as I said, 10,000 children born with thalassemia every year. So, which is a lot of work to be done. But still, um, it forms a good chunk of uh, transplant activity in the country. Um, this is one of the this is the experiences which we had published before. It's a, it's, it's a couple of years old uh, uh, old paper, um, but that time we analyzed about 100 odd patients at our center. We have now about about 200 thalassemia transplants. This was the age distribution. Um, majority of them in the range of five to nine years. But some of them are older children as well. If you see 10 to 14 years, um, are also there. Some of them and a couple of adult patients as well. Um, this was the class stratification we were discussing, and class one was six, class three were eighteen, and class two was seventy six. So this is the INA really. So when we when you see the data from the Western literature nowadays, we see the class ones being the majority. But in India, we have late referrals. Um, uh, you know, we see, we see the we see the we see the opposite. You know, we see only six patients out of hundred are class ones. And now when we when we extend this to two hundred patients currently, we see, we have the similar demographics. You know, only 10, 12, I think sixteen or seventeen patients are class ones. The rest all are are class or class three. And uh, this is the marrow is a preferred source for for bone marrow transplant and thalassemia. We all know that uh, PBAC has about a higher higher chances of graft versus host disease, especially the chronic graft versus host disease. So as much as possible, we have been trying to use marrows as a source of graft. And we have at times when when the, when the, when the donors have been small, we have at times done 
marrow collections at at sequential at, at two different time points. Store the first one. Give you know take another one after a couple of months and give the two graphs together to counter out, counteract um, the uh, the uh, the incidence of graphic source disease. This is the data in our patients with acute graphic source disease about 23 odd percent. Um, and when we when we when we when we when we segregate that data as per the donors. You can see that unrelated donor transplant, 60% is, is the graft versus host disease um, incidence. Um, we all know the reasons for that. We know that unrelated donors are, are, are always, especially in India, you know, they, they are not, they are not really up, up, upcoming for bone marrow harvest. So, majority of the collection which happened from unrelated donors are from the PBSE, especially in India. Uh, in fact, uh, we were the first center to, to have unrelated donor bone marrow harvest last year and I think since then Dadri has done two or three bone marrow harvest uh, from unrelated donors but predominantly has been PBSC and then PBSC that, that's what re reflects here in a very high instance of graft versus host disease and that's one of the points I want to make is that unrelated donor transplants please try to ask your registries push for a marrow harvest and this has been happening we are getting marrow products from Germany from NMDP in US but I think we need to push our Indian registry also to, to counsel donors for bone marrow harvest as the stem cell sources. Uh, this is the grade 3 to grade 4, again, grade 3 to grade 4, unrelated donors are the ones which are, which are troubled about 40 odd percent. Haplos, amat siblings, quite, quite reasonable graft versus host disease uh, incidents. Chronic graft versus, graft versus not much, I think 14 to 50 percent, and most of them have been quite limited, hasn't been a much of a problem. Or our survival, the whole group has been about 85 to 88 percent, and if we, if we then again divide into three groups of class 1, class 2, class 3, none of the class 1s have failed or, uh, or been fine in cure of the disease. Class 2 about 87, 88 percent, and the class 3, we all know, don't do as well as 60 percent. And this is what similar kind of graphs I showed you for the data from Italy as well. Um, this is the treatment related mortality. So in conclusion, so we, we, we know that the best outcomes in, in thalassemia are from mad sibling transplants and uh, we know that how class is important uh, for not for only oral survival but also with thalassemia survival. Um, now going on to the third, uh, third uh, important uh, I think discussion which I have been having since morning also is, is the third important source of um, uh, stem cells or uh, donor is haploid for transplantation. So um, we have heard about it a little bit since morning. Um, when um, the haploid transplantation was started first in thalassemia, it was again started from Sorani's group in, from Italy. What they showed, what they tried to do is that they tried to do this this preparation of this patient before transplant for one and a half months using hydroxyurea and azathioprine. They used quite intense immunosuppressive conditioning regimen with bucelfan, thiotip, or cyclophosphate ATG. The graft manipulation which they did was CD34 selection. This was the initial kind of you know um, experience with haploid transplant thalassemia. There was good oral survival. I mean, not many patients died, but but there was there was a very high rejection rate, about 30 odd percent. So even after using this intense um, immunosuppression for conditioning, but using CD34 selection, only about 70 percent, 60 of the patient, percent of the patients could be cured, which is really not 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 what we really intend to do in a thalassemia transplant. It, it, it seems to be good for a leukemia leukemia transplant, but not for a thalassemia transplant. We started our hyperlocal transfer program uh, quite early, I think 2015 we started um, and um, we, uh, we we moved away from this CD34 selection, we never tried CD34 selection thalassemia but we did TCI alpha beta depletion as a, as a treatment modality, as a, as a depletion modality and use the same strategy as the Italians have been doing, preparing them before transplantation, giving intense immunosuppression for conditioning and then using TCI alpha beta for the, for the, for the graft manipulation. First two patients went well, but then the third and fourth patient I had trouble. So what used to happen is that they used to engraft very quick as Nicholas said, day 10, day 12, they'll engraft, counts are fine, would start fever after two to three days, and then um, that fever would continue for days together, would not budge, you would do anything, you you, you work them from everything, everything possible, nothing happens, ferritin all over the place. In fact, the first patient who had this kind of situation, we thought is about HLH, we treat him with HLH, there was no response, I'll typically reject it. And the fourth patient, happened, the same thing happened. So I was frustrated, I called um, um, uh, tip engine Robert Rupert, Rupert, who has got mixed experience of these transplants. So he said, man, this is, this is rejection, um, you know, manifest in haplostorm. So this is the first time I heard this term. And we, in fact, this was coined around the same time, uh, haplostorm. So the, what happens, then graft, there's a rejection which is manifests as 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 a cytokine release release you know syndrome or cytokine storm. So we realized that yes, probably 
And this was, the, and, and we had parallelly started the program for leukemias as well. We didn't see this phenomenon of leukemias at all. You know, the leukemias were just sailed through. So that uh, made us to wait. We stopped the program on thalassemia. We continue, continue with leukemia, and we try to figure out what is happening. And what we realize is that probably the leukemia transplants are, are have already immunocompromised. They're already they, 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 because the chemotherapies and the lines of chemotherapy they have received before, they are already so immunocompromised that they probably are not able to manifest this rejection in this format. So we, we tried to use the same thing now for haplogroup. We, we restarted the program, and this was on a 15 uh, patients. We, we restarted the data on 15 patients. What we did is that we, we introduced a new pre transplant preparator regimen. And this preparator regimen was cyclophosphamide for one day, fildarvin for four days, and dexamis for five days. And we gave three of these cycles, um, three of these cycles are, are on a 15 days interval prior to the transplant. So it, it was our one and a half months of preparation prior to transplant, giving three cycles of that, and then conditioning of what we, with the routine condition which I've been giving, followed by the graft manipulation on haploid transplantation with TCR alpha beta depletion. And with that, I don't want to go the details of that. These are the patients for that. There were some class twos, class threes. Um, all are myeloability conditions. Uh, one, one, one or two patients who use triosulfan based also, but majority has been and has been flu view and uh, psi based conditioning. Uh, uh, we, I think I think Nicholas said that we rely on a very mega dose of CD34. So the median CD34 cells in this was about 16.6, a range from 9.5 to 28. Alpha beta we have always kept um, very low. We keep it less than you know um, um, less than 50,000 cells per per kg. Uh, gamma delta cells good gamma delta cell dose, CD20. The first patients we did had, had PTLD and a very bad PTLD who needed um, not only immune, uh, immune with, uh, suppression, withdrawal of immune suppression, but also using DLIs, very good DLIs to that fellow, in, including rituximab. So that made me to change the strategy. I think the Germans also do the same thing, is to use a rituximab on day minus one, a very small dose of rituximab, and after that we never see the PTLD again after that. So this is um, CD, CD20 cells, not many, and, and a very mega dose of uh, CD34s. Um, Neutrophil engraftment, as he as said, you know, is quite brisk, about 9 to 20 days, but median of 13, 14 days. Platelet engraftment, very quick. Uh, not much graft versus host disease, very minimal graft versus host disease. I think one or two patients are grade 3, but quite easily manageable. Um, uh, one patient, uh, one patient out of this, we lost to adenovirus disease. That's why I was asking him, what do you do for adenovirus disease? So, out of 15 patients, 14 were fine and and, and cured the disease, and for 92.3% survival, which seems to be quite decent now. Um, uh, in the concern, we are treating thalassemia here. So, um, um, sorry. So, event free survival also 93.92.3%. So, by by using the simple strategy of this pre transplant immune suppression, we could really change the change the change the way the, the, these transplants are done and, and the outcomes really have been different. So, uh, so one of the messages I want to convey here, when, you use, when, uh, when we use uh, haploidical transplantation, whether you use T-cell replete or T-cell re cell deplete, um, being at a center, we have got a uh, luxury of doing transplants for both these indications. Uh, they are two different worlds altogether. A uh, melanin transplant is haploidin transplant is different, and haploidin transplant and non is, is totally different. And we have um, this is one of the examples to suggest that that they will reject, they will they will not do as well as leukemia transplant. So we need to do some kind of strategy before we transplant them. And this has, this we have seen is some immunodeficiencies as well. I think Pooja is you know uh, is is well, getting a manuscript together for chronic granulomatous disease. Chronic granulomatous disease we have we have dealt with the same strategy. We immunosuppress them before and then transplant, and uh, they will not reject. Otherwise, rejection of chronic granulomatous is also very high when you use haploid transplantation. Um, this is the same uh, data set. I said one patient died with adenovirus disease, and uh, so this was the pre-transplant immunosuppressive preparatory regimen. And so what we see, what we feel that is well tolerated and manageable. There's not much uh, pre-transplant. These three cycles were very well tolerated. Only thing we did, we, we supported the growth factors so that they don't get febrile neutropenias and get them to the hospital. There was sustained engraftment and low rejection rates and improved disease free survival using this kind of uh, uh, technique. So. Um, uh, going back to the thalassemia status, as I said, 10,000 children born every year. Even if, even if 30 percent of them have mad siblings, that is, we need to do 3,000 transplants every year in India. I think we do about 300 or 400 a year. So there's, there's still a long way to go. And uh, this is just a summary of uh, just it should not go from here that the hybrid transplant is the is, is the frontline treatment for thalassemia major. Um, we know that mud transplants, that's unrelated siblings, are accepted transplant options for thalassemia. 
unrelated cause and a hypothetical transplant setting, uh, transplant should be probably done after discussion with the family and probably based on the center experience. But we need to watch the space. Uh, we already know that gene therapy is on, 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 uh, on the annual. This was a publication on sickle cell, though, um, recently in, in NEJ, and we already know that it, is sickle, it can make such an impact um, in, in these patients, especially the ones who are adults, who are class 3s, who may not have a traditional um, hematopoietic cell cell transplantation. And there's already data out on eight thalassemia patients. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be that promising thalassemia measure. Um, but those who are thalassemia intermediates, it has, it has shown a long-term um, uh, hemoglobin increment by 2 to 3 grams and probably with more refinement we can see some more changes in, in, this, uh, in this field. So that was what I want to talk about thalassemia. Before I close, because Nidhan had asked me to, uh, you know, uh, to, to share some experiences with you on our uh, TCR alpha beta depleted transplant um, in leukemias as well. Can I see the... So I'm just going to spend only five minutes now on the on the experience with uh, with the with the, the T-cell alpha beta we have had at our center. So this is the um, this is the way about the dot transplants now with all, all various indications listed here. Uh, with T-cell alpha beta, I think there were 45 uh, till now. This is the largest Asian experience we have. I think out of out of the US and uh, Germany, this is the largest uh, numbers. Um, um, this is in, this is the first. Uh, I'm going to show you a transfer to ALL, equivalent plus leukemia. This is our. Uh, this are, and these are all children. See, there are no adults in, in wrote in this in this uh, analysis. This is children who had transplants. About 33 odd um, children, um, B cells, T cells, and some of one of them was Y phenotypic as well. Um, um, all the three categories: match sibling. There's one mud. Um, but haplogroup transplant, both using T cell alpha beta as well as haplo using post transplant cyclophosphamide. So um, majority of them have been PVACs, as we all know, we prefer use PVACs in um, in in, uh, in malignant settings. Um, this is the distribution of these patients, median age of 77. Most of them have been TBI-based um, myelobility conditions. There has been some tweaking here and there based on the on the patient condition and other things, but said most of them have been TBI-based uh, conditionings. Um, uh, in recovery has been pretty brisk in haploid transplant as well as in, as in mad sibling uh, plate recovery almost similar um, this is the this is the uh, relapse rates so if you see that relapse rates in haplo with depletion has been only 2 out of 10 but with with post round cyclophosphamide 4 out of 7 mad sibling no one has relapsed yet because but most of them have been mrd negative prior to transplantation this is the graft versus host disease again with Haplo with depletion quite quite reasonable, but the ones with haplo T PTCY had a little bit higher graph resolution in our experience. Um, this is the um, uh, relapse rates. I, I think I explained it already. I'm going back now, um, and this is mortality. Now this is the uh, this is the outcome data. So the math siblings have really done well. We all know that that's the best graph to have. Um, uh, these are and these are relapse patients with ALL. So it's about uh, math siblings about eight, 